Red Badge of Courage, Chapter 19. When the two youths turned with the flag, they saw that much of their regiment had moved back. It moved back slowly, with faces still toward the forest and rifles still repay, replying to the fire. Several officers were giving orders with screaming voices. Where the hell are you going? The lieutenant was shouting, and a red-haired officer was commanding. Shoot into them! Shoot into them! The men were trying to do the opposite, and hopeless things. The youth and his friend had a small argument over the flag. Give it to me. No, let me keep it. Each felt satisfied with the other's possession of it, but each felt the need to declare, by an offer to carry the flag, his willingness to further risk himself. The youth roughly pushed his friend away. The regiment fell back to the trees. There it stopped for a moment to fire at some dark forms that had begun to follow it. Then it marched again, curving among the trees. By the time it again reached the first open space, the men were receiving fast and merciless fire. There seemed to be any enemy mobs all around them. The youth went along with slipping uncertain feet. With pride, he kept the flag straight. He called to the others. To those he knew well, he made special appeals, begging them by name. Between himself and the lieutenant, there was felt fellowship and equality. Let's pause here for a second. So the youth is now in a position of honor. He is, he is a flag bearer. He's holding the flag for the entire regiment, sort of symbolic of their, of their fight and their, you know unity and, and all of that kind of stuff. And now he sees himself as sort of an equal of the lieutenant, whom he was disparaging recently as being a terrible human being. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting that there was no equality between them and the lieutenant was in a uh, commanding position. And now he and the youth seem to be equally doing the same job and, and sort of on the same side. Um, Let's see. But the regiment was a broken machine. There's our machine imagery again. Um, you know, it's it's not able to do the killing that it was designed to do. The two men shouted at a forceless thing. The soldiers who had heart to go slowly forward were continually shaken by a certainty that others were going back. Wounded men were left crying on the sorrowful journey. There was smoke and flames always. The youth looked once through a sudden clearing of smoke, saw a brown mass of troops. The youth walked straight ahead with his flag in his hands, took a stand as if he expected an attempt to push him to the ground. He passed over his forehead a hand that trembled. His breath did not come freely. The officers labored hard to bring the men into a proper circle to face the enemy. The ground was uneven and torn. The men curled into the hollows and fitted themselves behind whatever would turn away a bullet. So here's a, a really desperate situation. They advanced on this attack that was sort of a doomed attack. The attack stalled and they started retreating and now they find themselves um, basically surrounded on three sides, being shot at by rebels and they've, they've formed into a ragged circle and um, are sort of laying down and the youth is standing there with a flag in the middle of being fired at sort of from three sides. So it's it's a brutal situation that Crane is, is narrating here. Uh, the youth noticed with surprise that the lieutenant was standing with his legs far apart and his sword touching the ground. The youth wondered what had happened to his voice because he no longer cursed. There was something strange in this little pause of the lieutenant. He was like a child who, having cried, raises his eyes and looks upon a distant toy. The silent men were suddenly strengthened by the eager voice of the lieutenant screaming, Here they come! Right on us, by God! His other words were lost in a wild roar of thunder from the men's rifles. Uh, so the enemy's now advancing on them. The youth's eyes had turned instantly in the direction indicated by the lieutenant, and he saw the soldiers of the enemy. They were so near that he could see their faces. Their uniforms were rather gray, being light gray with touches of bright color, and their clothes seemed new. The troops had apparently been going forward, their rifles held in readiness, when the lieutenant had discovered them. Their movement had been interrupted by the shooting from the Blue Regiment. It seemed that they had been unaware of the closeness of their blue enemies or had mistaken the direction. Almost instantly, they were hidden from the youth's sight by smoke from the busy rifles of his companions. He strained his eyes to learn the results of the shooting, but the smoke hung before him. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that because Henry is now holding the flag, he's a flag bearer, he's not shooting anymore. So he's sort of free to observe and you get his observations of the battle in a way that he wasn't able to do when he was focused on loading and firing, loading and firing you know, and, and combat. <clears throat> he strained his eyes to learn the results of the shooting, but the smoke hung before him. There appeared to be many of them, and they were replying quickly. They moved toward the Blue Regiment step by step. He seated himself sadly on the ground with a flag between his knees. But soon the blows of the enemy began to grow weaker. 
fewer bullets tore the air, and finally, when the men paused, they could see only dark floating smoke. The regiment lay still and watched. The smoke rolled away enough to show a lonely ground. It would have been an empty space except for the few bodies that lay in odd positions. At the sight of this scene, many of the men in blue began to dance with joy. Their eyes burned every time. Hold on. Their eyes burned and a cheer of gladness broke from their dry lips. It had seemed to them that events were trying to prove that they must lose. The other battles had tried to prove that men could not fight well. Then this small battle showed them that their chances were not hopeless, and thus they had proven themselves. Eagerness was theirs again. They looked about with pride, feeling a new trust in the rifles in their hands, and they were men. So there's this, you know, like they were all retreating, they weren't able to complete the combat, and so they weren't, they weren't men. Their masculinity was, I don't know, called into question. Uh, but partway through the retreat, there was a counterattack by the rebel army, and they were able to defeat that counterattack, so now they, they feel... I don't know, um, like they've they've gained their confidence back or whatever. Uh, but they're still in a dangerously exposed position out there on the battlefield, and we'll see how this all, all pans out in just a second. Uh, but before I pause this and, and turn this chapter off, uh, let's take a look at Henry's actions, okay? Uh, has Henry changed? Think about you know, him running away and, and the experiences that he had and then the lie he used to return to the regiment and then his actions since that lie, since he put on the bandage on his head, the red badge of courage. Uh, has he been more courageous? Is this, is, is it, you know, this is, this is something that some people debate about this novel. Um, you know, it, what is, what is Crane trying to say here? Um, was it his experience of cowardice that forced Henry to be courageous? Or is it that he's wearing this badge that he has to live up to the bandage and the wound that he has to thereby verify his story uh, in the eyes of his companions? So is he being courageous simply because he's had a change and is now a courageous person? Or is he being courageous uh, to back up uh, the statement that he gave earlier that he, he was create, courageous and does it matter? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, are actions more important than words? And, you know, like these are a lot of questions and I don't think Crane offers a lot of answers. I think it's left to you, the reader, uh, to form your own opinion about this and what the nature of courage is and what we've seen in Henry. Uh, but let's let's think about that as we end this chapter. Maybe pause and have a discussion about Henry as a character. Is he courageous? Has he gone through a change or is he really the same? Is he a dynamic character? And What lesson can we learn from that? All right, I'm going to shut up now. Thanks.